lactate, hyperlactatemia, lactic acidosis. These are some further thoughts that I've had on this topic. A lot of this is going to be opinion based. I'm going to trawl a bit through the history of lactate and lactic acidosis and develop some themes that I mentioned in the previous tutorial. I hope you find it useful, but I guarantee you'll learn something. These are some further thoughts about lactate to complement the tutorial that I gave you on lactic acidosis. Much of this content is opinion based, but I will point out that I'm really familiar with the literature. I'm going to start with a discussion about the basic biochemistry of lactate and why we are 50 or 60 years behind in general in our understanding of this. I'm going to talk about lactate clearance and endpoints of resuscitation, late stage hyperlactatemia long after the injury is over, and intravenous fluids that contain lactate. Let's start with a trip to the Mediterranean, to the island of Malta and the city of Valletta. And if you were to wander over to this side of the city and down several flights of stairs, you'll come to this entrance. And that entrance leads to this corridor. And that corridor leads to an extraordinary time capsule of history. This is the location of the Lazarus War Rooms. This was the headquarters of the Allied forces in the Mediterranean during the Second World War prior to the invasion of Italy. And this location has been preserved as if Eisenhower has just left yesterday. If you wander around there, it's a tremendous tourist attraction. You will see all of the gadgets that they used back then, how they tracked all the flights and all the bombing squadrons and everything is so low tech. And despite the modern world that we live in, you think about all this artificial intelligence that people are talking about and the internet and the potential for Mars missions. And I often think, wow, why is it that so many of my colleagues are stuck with a mindset and understanding of certain aspects of science that have changed very little since the time that these particular war rooms were in operation? And I think this is particularly the case when we're discussing lactic acidosis. And I will make the point that the majority of people who think that they understand lactate don't. And the reason for this is that every doctor I know and virtually every healthcare professional I know believe that these are the pathways for carbohydrate based cellular energetics and that lactate is only produced when there is no oxygen available to generate pyruvate. This is demonstrably incorrect and that has been known to be incorrect for several decades. I want to take you on a short history of lactic acidosis. It was first described, I believe, by Johann Scherer in 1843 in a case series that described the presence of lactate in the blood of critically ill women who died of puerperal sepsis. The presence of lactate in the blood of living persons was first described in 1858. And it was many, many decades after this that the whole concept of acid-base balance was even considered. Moving on 100 years, William Huckabee of Boston receives credit for the early definition of lactic acidosis. Keep in mind that the measurement of lactate in the blood was not routinely performed at any stage in the 20th century. If you look at the table in his second paper, you can see that there's a strong correlation between the rise in the lactate and the fall in the bicarbonate. And that's what really defines lactic acidosis, a milliequivalent per milliequivalent change in the lactate versus the bicarbonate. It's not all strongly correlating because there may be multiple acid-base abnormalities present, but it's definitely an acidosis. In 1963, he refined the concept of lactic acidosis into two subgroups, type A caused by global oxygen deficit and type B which occurred despite normal oxygen delivery to the tissues. In this particular paper, he writes, one finds no hypoxemia when blood oxygen is determined in type B lactic acidosis. This type B acidosis was considered particularly problematic as a large proportion of patients in whom this was identified appeared to die. 10 years later, 50 years ago, the concept of type A and type B lactic acidosis were well recognized. And you can see this from the editorial in The Lancet that I've just shown you on the left-hand side of the screen. Now, Cohen and Woods subsequently in 1976 divided type B into B1 for underlying diseases and B2 for drugs and toxins. And in 
and they even included mesenteric ischemia as type 1a but i find this all unnecessarily confusing with lactic acidosis you need to have a decision tree and you need to follow it not try to arbitrarily define it too early and i would point out that for most doctors the story of lactate and lactic acidosis ends at this point of type a and type b but things have really moved on and this is a bit of a we are not worthy moment for me because this man, George Brooks, a scientist in Berkeley, has more than anybody else moved along the thinking of lactate over the past 40 or so years. And his job, he feels, is to rehabilitate lactate from being a waste product or a poison to being a cure. And I think it's worth quoting this article that the University of Berkeley published on its website. It's a historic mistake. It was thought that lactate is made in muscles when there is not enough oxygen. It has been thought to be a fatigue agent, a metabolic waste product, a metabolic poison. But the classic mistake was to note that when a cell was under stress, there was a lot of lactate and then blame it on lactate. The proper interpretation is that lactate production is a strain response. It is there to compensate for metabolic stress. It's a way for cells to push back on deficits in metabolism. That's just such a perfect description. Lactate is an energy shuttle and Brooks defined these energy shuttles in the late 1990s and the concept is relatively straightforward. Lactate has three major purposes. It's a major energy source. It is the major gluconeogenic precursor. It is a signaling molecule. It signals in an autocrine, paracrine and endocrine form and you could call it almost a lact hormone. Brooks suggests that lactate should be seen as a strain not a stress biomarker. If you are intellectually curious I would suggest that you read this review article The Science and Translation of Lactate Shuttle Theory. It was published in the journal Cell Metabolism in 2018 and it is available free online. Another one of Brooks's theories is that lactate, not pyruvate, is the endpoint of glycolysis. And as he says, it's like your Visa card. It's accepted everywhere. And this is what he says about lactate and pyruvate. For decades, scientists and clinicians believe that in cells, glycogen and glucose are degraded to the lactate precursor substance called pyruvate. That turned out to be wrong since pyruvate is always converted to lactate. Muscles, including the heart, will preferentially burn lactate if it is around over carbohydrates and fats. Well, here is a way of thinking about lactate as an energy source. If we look at our metabolism as being a mountain range surrounded by fields, we start off at ground level with dietary carbohydrates. Now, they need to be broken down to glucose, so you have to climb a hill to get to glucose. And then further up the hills, you get to the base of the mountains, and that's lactate. And lactate is at base camp. And that base camp can be used for several peaks. In other words, several different cells in the region. So all of the early metabolic work has already been done. And the next phase of conversion to pyruvate and oxidative phosphorylation and production of CO2 in energy comes from that lactate. And the lactate can be used by various different cells. So it's partially metabolized already and already available. But not only this, lactate can actually be exported. And remember, it's pumped out of cells by monocarboxylate transporters, and it can be pumped around the body to other tissues, such as the heart and the brain, or it can travel to the kidneys and the liver and be regenerated back into glucose. This, of course, is known as the lactate shuttle. I want to move on to the whole issue of lactic acidosis. It seems to me that there is a bit of lactic acid denial going on out there. There's like a conspiracy theory group who say, no, 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 there's no such thing as lactic acidosis. This is all hyperlactatemia with some weird other acidosis present, but it, you know, lactate isn't an acid. And a lot of this seems to have been stimulated by a much criticized paper by Roberg in 2004. The argument of this group seems to be that the hydrogen ion that is associated with the production 
of lactate is actually utilized within the cell so that when lactate is in the cytosol of the cell, it is actually a conjugate base, so it cannot cause an acidosis. Oh, and lactate is actually a buffer itself. Now, these are not good arguments. First of all, the measured lactate is in the extracellular, not the intracellular space. It has a pKa of 3.8, so it cannot ever act as a buffer in physiology. It is a weak chemical acid, but it is a strong physiological anion. As electrochemical balance must always hold, the presence of lactate in the extracellular fluid causes a drop in the strong ion difference. It is over 40 years since Peter Stewart applied the fairly obvious principles of physical chemistry to the previous pseudoscience of clinical acid base. And I don't want to be derogatory here, but the bottom line is that a lot of people's understanding of acid base is based on how acid base balance is interpreted using the base excess or the bicarbonate, etc. But not really looking at the chemistry that was going on underneath it. And Peter Stewart unpeeled all of this stuff and went back to basic science and started off with water and worked forward from that. And you will not find a physical chemist who will argue with you that the source of all hydrogen and hydroxyl ion equivalents in body fluids is derived specifically from water. And if you don't understand the electrophysiology of water, you can never understand acid base. And while some of Stewart's observations are open to criticism, and we will discuss this later on in the course on acid base, this fact is absolutely not open to criticism. In summary, Stewart proposed that all acid-base changes in the body result from alterations in water dissociation that are associated with changes in temperature, alterations in the strong ion difference that is somewhat analogous to the anion gap, alterations in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide or carbonic acid in the body, and alterations in the weak acid concentration. And the principal weak acids that we're talking about here are albumin and phosphate. If you are a user of the anion gap, you are a believer in the strong ion difference. The addition of lactate anions into the extracellular fluid immediately reduces the strong ion difference, and this results in changes in water configuration to express hydrogen ions. That lowers the pH and results in a fall in the bicarbonate consequent of buffering. It is imperative to remember that in the setting where you have sodium and potassium hydroxide, hydrochloric acid, carbonic acid, and various other strong anions and cations, that the vast majority of the hydrogens bind to the vast majority of the hydroxyls to form water. And in normal physiology, there is a minuscule quantity of hydroxyl equivalents that tune the pH to 7.4. Hence, I go apoplectic when I hear that other absolutely bogus argument about lactic acidosis that goes along the lines of how can you have a lactic acidosis if the pH is normal? But of course you can. We see it all the time in the ICU because there may be a concomitant respiratory or metabolic alkalosis. For example, the association of hypoalbuminemia, which causes alkalosis. There may be an increase in the underlying strong ion difference due to an increase in the sodium concentration. Or, for example, after you've given sodium bicarbonate therapy, sodium citrate therapy, etc. The body may also have compensated for the high lactate by wasting chloride, restoring the strong ion difference. The next thing I want to discuss is the issue of why it is that the majority of clinicians who see a lactic acidosis on a blood gas refuse to consider anything except hypovolemia as a cause. And also, once they identify the lactic acidosis, they insist on trying to fluid resuscitate patients against lactate as an endpoint. And I will tell you this, here and now, lactate is not a good endpoint of resuscitation. It is a misinterpretation of data that was accumulated over 20 years, and it's quite unsettling because it may lead to patients being injured by therapeutic strategies that are inappropriate and sometimes harmful. And the reasoning goes something like this. High initial lactate levels are indicative of poor outcomes. Persistently high lactate levels are indicative of poor outcomes. Lactate clearance is associated with improved outcomes. So 
is there any intervention that accelerates lactate clearance that can improve outcomes? And I'll show you some of the data. These, this is a paper that was published in Shock in 2009 that demonstrated that patients who didn't clear their lactate had really, really high mortality rates. But it's important to understand that 79% of patients who didn't clear lactate had a concomitant mixed venous oxygen saturation of 70% or greater, meaning that the majority of these patients had type B lactic acidosis. And how could you clear lactate? Well, for example, the general feeling amongst clinicians who are blinded to this think that you can increase oxygen delivery by giving crystalloid or colloid to increase preload, by giving dobutamine to increase contractility or cardiac output, by giving oxygen by way of blood transfusion to increase oxygen delivery and extraction. But there is absolutely no proof that any intervention of any shape or form that clears lactate or appears to clear lactate has any way of improving outcomes. And what has happened, I believe, is that we've entered into this whole thing of whack-a-mole that you know, probably every time the lactate goes up in an ICU, the patient seems to get a fluid bolus and they just relentlessly get these drive-by saline assaults. And you can come in the next day and discover that the patient is five liters positive over 24 hours. And you ask, well, why did the patient get all this fluid? Well, the lactate was still high, so we gave fluid. But this is madness because we know for sure that fluid overload worsens outcomes in critical illness and that there are no data that by giving fluid to dilute or whatever you're trying to do, the lactate actually improves outcomes. And I find this particular paper just unbelievable. This is the Andromeda shock trial. This was published in JAMA in 2019 and they randomized patients with septic shock to either what they called peripheral perfusion guided therapy versus lactate level targeted resuscitation. Now it's important to understand what they mean by peripheral perfusion guided therapy. This is capillary refill. This is where you squeeze the tip of the finger and see if it refills, right? This is something we've been doing forever. This is not some cool stroke volume variability or doing echo at the bedside or whatever. This is really basic stuff. And they found that the patients who were guided by peripheral perfusion therapy had a 35% mortality rate at 28 days versus the patients who were lactate clearance, whatever that means, presumably with lots of fluid, had a 43% mortality rate. Now that was not statistically significant. The p-value was 0 0.06 and the confidence interval just went over one. Um, but there was some indication that perhaps this whole approach wasn't great. And the SOFA score was significantly lower. That's the multi-organ failure score was significantly lower in the patients who had peripheral perfusion guided therapy. I think this is a really nice quote from this particular review article by Jan Bakker and his group in 2019. Seeking to lower lactate levels by whatever means, given the multiple events that regulate its blood levels, has no credibility and no logic in terms of hemodynamics, bioenergetics, or tissue protection. The idea of seeking to lower lactate by increasing its clearance in sepsis is both an illusion and a folly. Hear, hear. I think that this is a reasonable algorithm for working the problem of lactic acidosis. Obviously, it's quite detailed and you can pause the video to follow it along. Let's move on. If the lactate is rising in late critical illness, trauma, surgery, or during the recovery phase of the stress response, it may be a good sign. A low level of hyperlactatemia is common in late stages of critical illness or after major surgery, and it may or may not be accompanied by a mild acidosis. In this setting, hyperlactatemia is likely an important component of tissue repair and regeneration, including angiogenesis. It is known that rapidly regenerating cells produce a lot of lactate, that is known as the Warburg effect, and leukocytes that contain few mitochondria are hyperabundant during this phase of the stress and inflammatory response, and there is an oxidative burst part of cellular immunity that promotes glycolysis. As a consequence, when you have a lot of white cell activity, you have a lot of glycolysis and you have more lactate. And so I believe that this is actually a good sign in late stage critical illness. And again, 
don't start giving the patient fluid just because the lactate has drifted upwards. Nevertheless, if you see a patient with a high lactate and a low blood glucose, this is an ominous sign and it has been known for decades. This is a paper from August 1971 that determined that lactic acidosis with hypoglycemia was associated with worse outcomes. It has been estimated that up to 19% of all ATP used in the liver is used for gluconeogenesis in the physiological state. And so a combined high lactate and high glucose is indicative of adaptive hyperglycemia. Low glucose in the presence of high lactate likely represents failure of that response and it is a precursor of multi-organ dysfunction. In other words, low glycogen and failure of gluconeogenesis in the kidney and the liver. And this paper demonstrates that high mortality. Any experienced ICU nurse will tell you that when the 50% dextrose is hanging, it's time to call in the family. Blood glucose is maintained within specific limits regardless of whether or not there is dietary carbohydrate intake. Initially, glycogen is utilized, but lactate and amino acids are also reconstituted as glucose following gluconeogenesis. What these processes have in common is the liver. So when the liver is no longer able to maintain normal glycemia, particularly if the lactate is high, there is a major problem that is either endogenous to the liver or exogenous, such as splanchnic hypoperfusion. Either way, the outlook is poor. Let's move on to a discussion about intravenous fluids. And here's a question for you. Does anybody actually know what's in a bag of Hartmann's solution? The story of Hartmann's is interesting. There were two major players in the development of balanced salt solutions. There was Sidney Ringer, who was an Englishman who lived between 1834 and 1910. And then there was an American, Alexis Hartmann, who lived between 1898 and 1964. So they, they barely crossed over in their ages. Now, Ringer, in the 1880s, before Hartmann was even born, working in London, was working on isolated frog hearts. And there was a bit of a botch up in the lab. His lab tech, instead of using distilled water, used tap water for one of the experiments. And suddenly the experiment worked. And what Ringer deduced from this was that there were some electrolytes that were in the water that made the frog's body stay alive longer. And this really led to the rediscovery of electrolytes and plasma. I previously mentioned the work of William Brooke Shocknessy in the 1830s and subsequently on this topic. And eventually he constructed a fluid known as Ringer solution. That fluid contained a lot of chloride, but it was the first alternative to saline, I suppose, as an IV fluid. And it lasted a long time, but in some ways it was quite a flawed solution. As Stanley Hartman in the 1930s, he was working as a pediatrician in St. Louis, and he was looking for an ideal fluid with which to manage diabetic ketoacidosis in the knowledge that the standard fluid that was being used at that stage was isotonic saline, and there was a huge problem with hyperchloremia when patients were resuscitated with this stuff. So he was looking for a better fluid than saline. And what he did is he adjusted Ringer's solution by adding sodium lactate as the buffer. The fluid was believed to have acid neutralizing and anti-ketogenic effects due to the gluconeogenesis of lactate to glucose, presumably. It is curious that in his own country, this particular fluid is known as Ringer's lactate, mostly because Hartmann was a very reserved and modest individual. Everywhere else in the world, variations of this fluid are known as Hartmann's solution or compound sodium lactate, or as I like to call it, sodium lactate solution. Bizarrely, there are several different versions of this fluid available worldwide. In the United States, it's known as lactated ringer solution, and it contains 130 millimoles per liter of sodium, four of potassium, 109 of chloride, 28 millimoles of lactate, 1.5 millimoles of calcium, with an osmolality of 272.5. The UK version of Hartmann's solution contains 131 of sodium 
five millimoles per liter of potassium, 111 millimoles per liter of chloride, 29 of lactate, two of calcium for an osmolality of 278. The Australian version of Hartman's has the same osmolality, but has slightly more chloride, 112, and slightly less lactate, 28. Just by comparison, there is a solution known as Ringer's solution that's used for cardioplegia, and that contains a massive amount of chloride that has 155.5 millimoles of chloride. It has some potassium, it has lots of sodium, but it has no lactate, and its osmolality is 309. Plasmolite and Normosol are pretty much identical fluids that have no lactate in them. The so-called buffer is acetate and gluconate, and that is 27 millimoles of acetate and 23 millimoles of gluconate, and the osmolality is 294. One of the big questions about this particular fluid is what happens to the gluconate, because nobody really knows how that is metabolized. Acetate and lactate are very easy to metabolize. But one of the big questions about Hartman solution or lactated ringers is what form of lactate is in it? Is this a racemic mixture of both D-lactate and L-lactate, or is it a just a single isomer of L-lactate? And the reason why this is important is because D-lactate may not be as innocuous as you might think. Now we make L-lactate in our body, that's what causes lactic acidosis, and movement across cell membranes is specific to L-lactate. D-lactate is overproduced with short bowel syndrome, with duodenal uh, ileal bypasses in abdominal compartment syndrome, in any situation where bacteria just overgrow in the body and then the lactate is absorbed through the bowel wall and can cause a widened anion gap acidosis with a relatively normal looking lactate on the blood gas because it's not picked up. D-lactate is believed to be neurotoxic leading to encephalopathy, confusion, dizziness and abnormal behavior. So it is preferable that future IV fluids will have L-lactate alone. And there is some work that has been done on this using hyperosmolar lactate solutions that contain L-lactate over the past decade or so, but none of this has come to market yet. The other fluid, of course, that has been brought to market is Ringer's acetate, where the lactate is replaced by acetate. And some people believe that Ringer's acetate is less likely to cause an acidosis than Ringer's lactate. Uh, you kind of wonder about this. There's one paper that's actually been done on this, and they did show that there was a slightly more alkalinizing effect using Ringer's acetate than Ringer's lactate or Hartman's solution. I believe that this is clinically insignificant. You know, I think it doesn't really matter which fluid you use in terms of acid base, as long as you stay away from isotonic saline solution in a patient who is either acidotic or has a normal pH. If a patient has severe alkalosis, yet saline is great because it brings up the chloride. Finally, I just thought I'd mention very briefly the treatment of lactic acidosis. And the reason why this is brief is because there is no treatment. I will say to you that many decades of research into the use of sodium bicarbonate in patients with lactic acidosis have failed to demonstrate any benefit from this approach. You would think, for example, that if you give sodium bicarbonate to a patient who has a metabolic acidosis, particularly lactic acidosis, that vasopressors will work better, but this has never been demonstrated. I will also argue that you should not institute continuous kidney replacement therapy for patients with metabolic acidosis where lactate is the major cause because lactate is not well filtered by the membrane and of course it's being continuously produced by the body in massive quantities and nothing is resolved. So you're just literally dialyzing a patient with intravenous fluid. It doesn't make sense. Treat the cause, not the number. That is the secret to managing the patient with lactic acidosis. Figure out what's going on with them, what's causing this biomarker to go up, why the liver isn't clearing the lactate, and solve that problem, and the lactic acidosis will solve itself. Now let's look at the high impact points. Most clinicians overestimate their knowledge of lactate and consider it to be a waste product of aerobic metabolism. It is not. 
Lactate is likely the end product of glycolysis and a major fuel source for the body. It also does so much more. Lactate is always an arrhenous acid within the body regardless of the pH. Lactate is not a good endpoint of resuscitation, so when you hear the term clearance, think about metabolism, not something that you can do to the patient, because if you target lactate with IV fluids, sodium lactate solution, this may result in excessive fluid resuscitation, fluid overload, and adverse outcomes. A high lactate and a low glucose is an ominous sign, and there is no specific treatment for lactic acidosis. Future IV fluids will likely replace the racemic mixtures with single isomers of L-lactate. So that was lactate, hyperlactatemia, and lactic acidosis. Some thoughts that I've had on this particular topic. If you're enjoying these tutorials, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, leave me some comments and some likes, and follow me at ccmtutorials.org where there will be some supplementary material.